Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Chris Marshall. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for being on the show today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's an absolute honor and privilege to be here. Yeah, well, I am super excited to pick your brain because you do have a very extensive background in a lot of things. Um, and I, well, first of all, I have a surprise question. I've never asked anybody this, but what is your latest rabbit hole obsession? Like what oh. is the last thing that you just deep dive? That That's a really good one. Uh, I dive down a lot of different rabbit holes. Um, as you probably know from my background, and as I think we'll probably get into on this podcast. Um, the latest thing is I'm just going to say the title and then I'll explain what I mean. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, so is is playfulness our pathway to anti-fragility? And so let me unpack that statement. Um, we have talked an awful lot in kind of recent decades about resiliency, mental toughness, all of these wonderful things, which essentially mean when something bad happens, we don't break or we bounce back to where we were before. Um, and that's really wonderful, but there's a property beyond that. And that property beyond that is what we'd call post-traumatic growth. It's where actually chaos builds us, makes us stronger. And so an awful lot of the stuff I look at, my, my research looks at playfulness, not as in playing games and uh, kind of having a laugh with each other, although that can be part of it, but actually playfulness in terms of how it makes us far more cognitively flexible, how we're able to see positives, even in really dire situations. And so the latest rabbit hole is, does playfulness lead to this property of where we actually grow from disruption if we're truly playful in, in our nature and our mindset? Well, and a lot of people wear that as like a badge of honor, you know, like, oh, mm. I'm a workaholic. I am a perfectionist. I, you know, I work 60, 70, 80 hours a week and they, they wear it like a badge of honor where it could be slowly deteriorating their brain and right. their, their nervous system and everything. So where's the balance? Yeah, completely. And I think that kind of touches on, on how I got to playfulness. So I, I wear a lot of hats. I, I kind of do a lot of things. I'm a busy person. I, I have a packed schedule. I love that, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but actually about oh, six years ago, so we're going back to kind of 2018, maybe 2017, I properly burnt out. I actually landed myself in hospital. And um, that it was a rather embarrassing hospital visit, not only because when you actually don't listen to your body that much and you en end up in hospital, that's rather embarrassing by its own account. Um, but I was actually researching mental toughness and resiliency. And it was, it was meant to be that if you really understood those concepts, then you were protected from stress. And all of a sudden I found myself lying in hospital going, um, I'm meant to be kind of an expert in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've not managed to make it work. And that was really this pivotal moment of going, okay, well, what's missing or what's missing from my understanding? And often what we do is, as you were kind of talking about, we use those constructs, those kind of mental toughness, hardiness, resiliency constructs, then they're, they're often really, really rigid. And it's often about, I can dig deeper, I can do more, I can push through. And that's great to a point. But if you're not actually, if there's not that introspective part, if there's not that actually listening to what's going on, and actually I'd say enjoying what you're doing, Mm -hmm. which was where playfulness comes in, then you essentially go down the same path that I did. And, you know, you might be, you might be full of challenge. You might have all these deadlines, which is inspiring you and getting you kind of the dopamine hit from your, your, right. your, your body system. But it comes a point where your body needs to also rest and relax. And, and we, we kind of get, we, we get tied up in this because the, those current constructs mean, well, do we just stop? Do we kind of take a massive step back and go, okay, well, now I need to pause all of my projects in life right, so that right. I can I can get back on it. And actually that's not the answer. The answer is just how we approach the, the tasks that we're, we're dealing with and the, the mindset we bring to them. Um, so yeah, this, this is where it becomes fascinating. It is. And do you think that the brain, our brains are set up and um, meant to multitask? Yeah. Well, okay, let's let's pull let's pull this apart. I think we thrive multitasking 
I mean, I think there's enough evidence to say we can't actually multitask, i.e. we can only really do one task at a time and we can switch very quickly. Do I think that we're, we're kind of set up to do multiple passions and dive down lots of different avenues? Yes. Okay. But maybe, maybe not all at the same time. Um, so it depends on your definition of multitasking. Um, but I'd kind of go back to when we're, when we're kind of truly playful in life. I mean, look at kind of the Renaissance period. We had these wonderful thinkers, wonderful kind of artists and creators. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they didn't just have one passion or one hobby. And I think actually what you find is when you have multiple passions, multiple hobbies, they, they feed each other. You, you're growing and you're growing wisdom, you're growing experience. Right. And too, too often we have gone down the route of going, oh, well, this is my narrow bit of life. And this is what I'm the expert in. I call it hyper-specialization. And that's essentially what we've, we've built the economy on and careers on is becoming a hyper-specialist. But yeah. where, where we are right now, we have so much change going on in the world that actually being a hyper specialist, I think is potentially dangerous because you're blinkered. You can't see other things going on and you need a greater appreciation of what's going on in the world at the moment to navigate it. And I think that disruption and change is only going to increase over the next couple of decades. Yeah. I can't remember if I read it or if I heard you in a podcast talking about how you hate it when people ask you what you do, because you do have your hands in a lot of different pots and, um, just to sidetrack, like when I started my podcast, I was more of a focus because I was talking about hairstyling and being behind the chair. Well, then when I got done doing hair, I decided I wanted to keep the podcast, but I wanted to make it a variety show, talk to everybody because I'm interested in so many different things. And I love because of being a hairstylist and just a person, I love talking to different people all the time. That's kind of how I'm wired. And so when people are like, you're never going to get any listeners, you're never going to have high numbers because people like niches. They like to, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I like to do all the things. I like that. So I didn't know, gosh, do I have ADHD? Like, is it something <laughs> wrong with my brain that I can't focus and center in on one thing to me, I think I would get bored. Yeah. And, and I I'm completely with you and I do have ADHD. So <laughs> I, think you know, I but, do too. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's maybe part of why I love this kind of multi-passioned life and, and everything else. But I'd, I'd throw the question back to you actually. So, you know, you've gone through that journey, you've gone through that transformation of kind of being that kind of niche talk show or that kind of niche podcast. What are some of the things that you've grown from, from like inviting in all those different voices? What are some of the things which stand out? Oh my gosh, so many things. I've learned so many things about the brain. I've learned things about nutrition. Mm. I've learned, it was things that I was always interested in, but I never knew a lot about. I, uh, what is it that they say? Like, I know a little about a lot. And so yeah. now I'm learning about a lot of things and learning more and not just little tidbits of information. Like I'm, I feel like I'm going to school every time I do a podcast, I feel, and I never Amazing. liked school. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like a real people school where I'm actually interacting and getting the answers, even if they're dumb questions, I feel like I'm finally getting the answers and I'm, I'm getting them in a way that I can receive them at least. And so I have to figure other people out are out there thinking the same Com completely. And I, I think there is this calling, you know, going back to what I was saying before, we, we have gone down this, this kind of hyper specialist route in society and culture and schooling and education, everything. If you think about the education system, it starts at what we would call primary school in the UK. I guess yours is kindergarten. That's probably the, the yeah, an elementary school. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and from that point, is as soon as you hit about 12, 13, 14 years old, you start to select subjects. And that that keeps funneling and funneling until you get to one. And then if you keep going further with kind of like a postgraduate degree or a doctorate, then you you end up at this tiny niche area. And I'm not saying this is bad, but it's 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 a narrowing field and everybody kind of goes down this funnel. And I think what's beautiful is we are living at a time when people are starting to open that back up. And I think there's so many benefits to the human race, to ourselves, to people who are, live around us. Um, so for a long time, I hated the phrase, or hate is a big word. 
I I kind of was scared of the phrase a jack of all trades. Yeah. Um, I felt like, oh my word, is that me? Um, you know, because I've I've got the hat of I don't know executive coach and I'm a trainee psychotherapist. I mean, there's another rabbit hole that I'm coming coming into at the moment. Um, I'm about to do my PhD in playfulness. I'm uh, an investment strategist. I could keep going. I, I had a distillery for a while. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that jack of all trades is always promoted as, oh, it is a negative. Um, it's always put across as, oh, you've never really kind of focused enough on one topic, but people miss the second part of the quote. And it's actually a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm going to get this completely wrong. <laughs> Your listeners will. master of none. Is a master of none, but often a bet- better than a master of one. Oh, okay. So that's that's the oh, that's the okay. original. Um, gotcha. But w- but we just cut it at the first point because it fits the com- the the current kind of uh, cultural narrative that we have. Mm-hmm. That we should just have this one career, this one specialization, and it should be as as small as possible. And sometimes you can't, I don't know, you you can't argue with people that have gone down that route. It's it's financially, it's a really, really successful route to go down, specialize as, as close as you can. Yeah. And you can make a ton of money from it. Right. But but is it where life is? Yeah. Well, uh, and it makes you interesting. And then, you know, I'm sure if you go to family things, they're probably like, well, Chris, what are you up to these days? <laughs> like, last time I talked to you, you were doing a TEDx talk. What are you doing today? I'm sure it's like that because people don't know what to expect. You're, you're constantly learning. And I think yep. that's just what life is about. Yeah. I, I, I kind of sometimes call it the people who, who are around me. I, I often say that I, I feel like I sometimes give them whiplash. Um, <laughs> like they'll meet me one month and it's kind of like oh what's I think your question right at the start was a lovely one what's the current rabbit hole what's the current obsession um, and yeah and I kind of I'm starting to as I get a little bit older uh, I, I don't know to accept that and embrace that's my nature um, and I'm also starting to see that they are feeding each other all these mm-hmm. different areas that I have like the transfer of skills from starting a a distillery so it was a complete a complete startup um actually it was north wales's first copper distillery in over 100 years um and it was just off the basis that i was i was curious i was absolutely fascinated with the process of distilling uh we have some of the world's best water here in north wales oh wow. um and uh yeah, it was just kind of like, why don't why don't we have a distillery up here? <laughs> there was one a hundred years ago, and there wasn't one at the time. So that that became just a fascination. Uh, I, I persuaded my wife at the time that she should part with our life savings. Maybe that maybe that contributed towards the divorce. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> the distillery was a success. So <laughs> 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 um, but but the lessons from growing that business and scaling it and ultimately merging it with another business have been fundamental in in my view of so many other things going on from how I approach setting up new ventures of, of networks of, of what really resonates with audiences and buyers. Um, and every time you kind of experience these things, you almost kind of pass it through a new set of filters, a new perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to me is, is now, Finally, it's coming all the way around. I think for a long time, that kind of jack of all trades and everybody else's view of, oh, Chris, you should really specialize in something or you should should settle down. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe take some more medication for ADHD. Yeah, it's not political well, view. Well, but... I, I go unmedicated. So, you know, what's worse? Um, uh, but you you are a behavioral scientist. So do you feel like in, in your scientific opinion that people are afraid to to try different things, afraid to not, because it's like in our belief system that you have sure. your elevator pitch, you know, when people say, oh, so what do you do? And you're like, I, ba, 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 ba. and everybody's <laughs> got their little speech that they say, the small talk, gross small, small talk that people do. I mean, do you think people are afraid to do anything but the norm? Yeah, absolutely. Because we're, we're fundamentally wired. I mean, let's bring this back to kind of our wiring and our nervous system and kind of like all of those bits and pieces we we don't we hate un, we hate things which aren't familiar i mean that's 
kind of one yeah. of the things. Right. Um, there's some comfort in kind of, hence why we have social groups, hence why we are social animals. Yeah. We love to be kind of, um, I don't know, have a familiarity to the people around us. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, if everyone else is doing this kind of one career, one specialization, this is how they do it. Then we kind of look in on that and we go, oh, well, why, why don't I fit in? <laughs> why, yeah. aren't I, why aren't I the same as that? And there's, I mean, there's a reason why we have what's called FOMO, the fear of missing out. Yeah. Um, and that's because we, we want to be very similar to others around us. Yeah. And that, that has some, some majorly kind of like a long history of how we've evolved to it. Um, so it would have been something, if we go all the way back to the days when we lived in caves, if we were different from the group, if we were outcast by the yeah. group, that's called death. Right. You know, you know there's a, there was a few things that could kill us. And one of them was a lion. Hence why <laughs> when, you know, kind of when we met with something kind of really unfamiliar, mm-hmm. then our stress response kicks in. And depending on how, how kind of strong that is, depending on our reaction, whether that's fight and flight or whether it's just complete flop and freeze. Um, But the other thing which could kill us is just literally our tribe just going, you're not part of us, get out. Yeah. Um, And we still have that in us. We we still have that need for social bonding, for social connection. And often that comes with familiarity. So when we're talking about breaking the mold, it takes a tremendous amount of courage. And this is actually where I I think that we live in this wonderful time. I mean, take your podcast, for, for example, you know, kind of, these conversations, we can build a tribe of others who are doing something similar. We are no longer confined to the people who live on our streets and what are they doing? We're now able to go, well, where's my tribe? And my tribe isn't necessarily my next door neighbors. It's people like you all around the world who are going, I want, I, I know there's something more beyond this boundary I'm living in and I want to push it. Yeah. Um, so so th- yes, absolutely. Don't, <laughs> I don't know whether that answered your question. I can't even remember what your question I don't, was. I don't remember what my question was either. <laughs> people are scared of change though. Change petrifies yeah. people. Like even yeah. just the subject of AI, when it was first like starting to creep into people's feeds, oh my gosh, on the podcast pages that I go on, people are like, oh my gosh, you, you, you are not going to rate your own stuff. You're not going to, you're not a creator if you're, and it's like, well, I borrow it sometimes just for inspiration, or I have it do some of my tasks that I don't want to do, like typing out show sure. notes and stuff. Yeah. Um, I find it very handy, but I would never, Absolutely. I mean, it's not, I'm not a robot right now. Like this is just me. It's not taking the place of people's jobs or people, you know, I think it's just supposed to be an aid and supposed to help, but people are absolutely freaked out about it. Completely. But then if we go back to the 1980s, maths teachers were absolutely freaked out by the calculator. Um, And, you know, kind of, is this going to ruin children's minds? They're not going to be able to do arithmetic anymore because there's this machine that adds for them. Um, And that's really kind of why I wrote the book Decoding Change. So, you know, to kind of bring this into a slightly different stream, decoding change. I mean, the subtitle is, <laughs> will I get my subtitle all right? <laughs> it's, some, it's something like uh, understanding what the heck's going on and why we should be op- more optimistic about the future. Um, because when I wrote that, I started writing, I think it was 2018. Um, when I started writing that, I think one of the common themes I was seeing was everybody was so negative about the future mm. that it was kind of like the end of the end of history was being talked about that that I don't know the world's just going downhill and we've got all this bad stuff happening yeah and like what's the point anymore and it was just this really sour mood mm-hmm. and coming from my perspective of seeing innovation of seeing creation of mm-hmm. seeing creative minds and these most incredible kind of technological advances coming through, I, I was kind of seeing a completely different world to what I was coming across in the general public. So I wanted to write the book Decode and Change, partly to help people see that bigger picture, um, because I think there's a lot of behavioral reasons why we don't see a positive future. And 
I'm going to completely throw the media under the bus here because they they know how to sell stories. Yeah. And the way they sell stories is just put a negative headline and hopefully also some negative content because you and I, that need to survive, if it's negative and we think it relates to us, oh my word, we've got to know about it. Right. Uh, so we click on it, even though it's absolutely trash and pointless. Um but it still influences our perspective of what's going on. So, so when I wrote that book, that, that was really about kind of, well, why should we be optimistic about the future? And can I demonstrate by looking at these massive trends and mega trends around the world, can I demonstrate that we've gone through similar cycles before of high disruption, of high technological change, of, of even demographic change, of cultural change, and have we, what's happened? What was the result? And when you look at it, the, there was one key message that consistently comes out. And that is us humans, when we're at our best, we are the most adaptable, creative and innovative creatures that have ever, ever walked this planet. And there are time, timeless counts kind of over and over again, where there are situations where the human race should not have walked away from it. And not only did we walk away from it, what I was talking about right at the start of the show was we thrived from it. We grew from it. We progressed. So we could take, I don't know, let's take the industrial revolution, absolutely change the face of the earth in terms of how people worked. Countless careers, countless yeah. industries disappeared that all of a sudden, I mean, in, I don't know what you had in the States, but in the UK, we even had jobs, right? Here, here's, here's a good example. We had a job called a knocker upper um and that person because there weren't any alarm clocks well there weren't any clocks <laughs> uh that you could kind of set to wake you up yeah. and now you have new factories that you have to i don't know i'm going to make this up now but <laughs> you have to turn up at 9 a.m because <laughs> suddenly we have time management right um and so how do you get to work on time if you can't set an alarm clock so a whole new career industry formed of people with really long poles and they come and tap on the bedroom window to wake you up Oh my gosh, so, I never have heard of such a thing. Yeah. And and so so not only did that career start, but then all of a sudden when we invented the alarm clock, whenever that was, or a method, right. I guess it was a grand a grandfather clock that chimed or whatever it was. Um then all of a sudden that career also disappeared. And it's it sounds like a stupid example, but you can find countless of these. It's, you know, we could talk about horse and carts. We could talk about all the, all the kind of careers and industries and jobs connected to that before we got to the automobile, before we got to the train. Um, and what, we, what happens is, yes, there's a massive amount of disruption at paradigm shift. And we are at a paradigm shifting moment in history. But what happens is things that we can't even imagine, careers we can't even imagine today are going to be developed in the future. Right. We we don't just sit around. We don't just sit back and go, oh my word, my job's gone. Well, that's me done and <laughs> dusted. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> what am I going to do next? And there's people right. out there pushing things forward, and they they are the ones, the innovators and the creators that make way for completely new things that we can't even imagine. And I think that's terrifically positive. It is. It is. That's awesome. It's a good way to think about it because, like, I help care for the elderly now, and they're always amazing. It, things aren't the way they were back in my day, music back in my day, in my day, we used to do this and this and to them that is perfect, but we all do it. You know, yep. like uh, the music I hear now on the radio, sorry, musicians, I hate it. <laughs> and I'm always listening to my own Spotify list of all the music that I like from back in the day or whatever. Why is that? What is the reasoning why we always think that the way things were when we were growing up we're so much better. I mean, think about the people that I'm talking about, the elderly. They went through world wars. Yeah, absolutely. How is it and so this, great. And, <laughs> and, the, and they still drafted. say it was the golden age. Right. I mean, it's a, it's amazing. Right. And I think that I think that speaks of the resiliency of human nature. Um, is just that terrible things can happen, and f unfortunately, frequent frequently do happen. But yet, it's not the event that defines us. And this is where we come all the way back to mindset and kind of playfulness and everything else. How we respond to that is, is really what matters. Um, as for kind of like things that happen as we age, we know that unfortunately we do, we do become less playful. 
through age. Mm-hmm. We certainly become less curious. Um, and so, you know, that's that's one of the things which I think I think we actually need to continue to develop and cultivate in ourselves as we age mm-hmm. is to keep pushing curiosity because curiosity is what is is a is is a is a fantastic kind of a characteristic attribute state of mind whatever you want to call it it's it's what drives us forward to discover new things and that's where life is it's mm-hmm. in the it's it's not in in the rigid same old same old if you go too far down that path it's it's not far from depression right whereas curiosity stands at the opposite end of that spectrum so in in my kind of playfulness research my my model of playfulness that i developed um but essentially is is three pillars so it's curiosity creativity and connectedness and if you're high in those three pillars you're a playful person playful mindset um and curiosity is one of those one of the three fundamental pillars and what we know from research so we did a, a research piece recently um so i i do some work for a fantastic little company called the wisdom council that feeds into the finance community mm-hmm. and we did a piece of research and we were looking at how positive were people who displayed playfulness and actually what we found was generally people were were slightly pessimistic overall but those who were high in playfulness or certainly the the part of curiosity they were they were, I'm, I'm again, going to make some figures up, but none of your listeners know the data. So I'll, so I'll get away with it until I admitted that. <laughs> uh, Don't be a buzzer. It, <laughs> 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 but yeah, the baseline was about minus 19 on, on, the, on the optimistic, pessimistic side. Those high in, in curiosity were scoring 88. Those who were really low in curiosity were like minus 60. So like super pessimistic. And so there's, a, there's this interesting link not only between kind of resiliency and bouncing back and even growing from chaos, but also if we develop curiosity and we cultivate that throughout life, it's part of, it's part of what makes us optimistic. It's part of what drives us towards the future. It's part of what makes us learn new things and find enjoyment in spaces that otherwise we wouldn't. Well, I think the other C that interferes with all of that is control. We all Mm want to control how everything plays out and what, instead of just, well, let's be playful. Let's just see where this takes us. Let's, you know, assume that it's going to go great. But a lot of people have a hard time with that, just letting go of the control factor. And so I think that really is what negates all of it. It's just people (laughs) people don't want to let go of control. They want to know what the outcome is going to be and they don't care how they get there. They just want to know what the final yeah, and, and I, think... I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know but this I think, for I... a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that is again kind of our responsibility, both to ourselves and those around us, is is we can train ourselves to actually not only accept uncertainty, but potentially even f- love uncertainty. And that sounds that sounds like kind of like fantasy land when you talk about unicorns and rainbows, but it's it's not when you start. So there's, there's, there's one thing that I, I get people to try and do. Um, and that is to, I, I completely stole this idea. It's not mine. <laughs> well, at least you admit it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's from a, a brilliant psychotherapist called Bill O'Hanlon, um, who wrote a book. I mean, his book, I'm going to promote his work probably more than mine now, but uh, he wrote this book called Do, do One Thing Different or something like that. I'm not very good with titles. As you can tell, I can't even remember my own book's titles. <laughs> Um, but do, yeah, do one thing different. And I mean, this book got him on Oprah. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was, yeah. And, and the premise of the book without kind of spoiling it for everybody, um, is essentially just that this really simple notion that every day just do something different and it could be do a different task or it could be doing a familiar task in a different way. And I often include this kind of if I'm doing like workshops or coaching with people, because it's a really, really simple way to start the process of just kind of loosening up that control thing. Yeah. And kind of like we're we're so knotted up sometimes. It's like that Mm -hmm. ball of string. (laughs) Yeah. And there's like, where do you start untangling this? But if you can just start to tease it apart, all of a sudden things start to shift. And and what's amazing. So I, I, 
challenged myself just to do this for 30 days, do one thing different. Uh, this is going back a couple of years. Um, and what was amazing was at the start, it was really easy. I mean, you, I don't know. I, I did one day where I just, I ate all my meals standing up um, just because I didn't normally do it. I right. wrote all my notes with my opposite hand. I, I decided, I don't know, one morning that I would get out of bed the other side. So I had to get out of my partner's side of the bed. Okay. Um, and you, you kind of just go through this. And, what, and what's, what's really amazing, what happens is that it, at first it's easy to find things. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm just kind of going through the motions. And then you start to get to this phase where actually it becomes harder and you actually have to really think, you have to be quite curious and creative to come up with, well, what, what, what am I going to do different today? I, I've seen to have kind of like used up all, all of these ideas. Yeah. And then you kind of find that actually it's endless. And not only that is you start to just see things that they aren't fixed. You stop living on autopilot that because you just kind of, these are things that you don't even realize that you do without any conscious thought. Right. Autopilot, you, yeah. Yeah, you're just kind of just on this standby mode so often. And just by just shaking something up each day, it's quite an easy process just to bring some awareness that everything around us is malleable. Yeah. Everything around us can change. We've just decided to do it in a certain way. And the first step of playfulness, I mean, think about a kid, a young kid. I've got two kids that are not so young anymore, but 15 and 12. But when they were tiny, like that they're, they're unpredictable i mean they're still pretty unpredictable at 15 and 12 but yeah yeah <laughs> um but there's a beauty to that and we lose that as we become adults because we as as you were kind of mentioning we love that kind of familiarity mm-hmm. we love the safety we you know we, we often have so much on our to-do list and our stress levels that go up when we're adults that we just want a, that kind of easy life and the easy life comes from just following i don't know patterns and habits that that we're not even aware of yeah and if we just start to shake that up we start to loosen that that ball of string which is knotted um yeah i think that is why we have a hard time getting in the present yeah because we are on autopilot we know what time we get up we know what we're gonna have for breakfast we know the route we're gonna take to work boom 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 it's all the same 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 and then we don't have to think about it and that takes the stress out of your day you think but um yeah i think that's why we have a hard time being present because we're in a zombie land of some kind completely yeah and it, as you as you rightly point out it works in the short term mm. in the long term unfortunately we lose the very basic things which make us that adaptable creative innovative creature we lose our playfulness is is yeah. the point because we we sacrifice it for ease and comfort and that doesn't that doesn't ultimately end well because we end up just rigid, stuck, uncreative, mm-hmm. unmotivated, low energy, unable to kind of move beyond the current status quo and boundaries. Right. I I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget what the heck is a wisdom council? That sounds like something from <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> Let me consult so, the Wisdom Council. <laughs> what is that? So, so the Wisdom Council is, was really founded, I, I'm going to say maybe about 10 years ago. Um, they do like some incredible work. They mainly work with investment managers, asset managers, but really kind of doing behavioral science stuff, looking at kind of how customers understand uh, marketing or products, uh, what potentially is needed from those and how kind of it's it's a very niche business within the financial and asset space okay but really really innovative um and they're they're very broad thinkers uh hence probably why i I fit in quite well (laughs) (laughs) well that's good we need we we need them all we need everybody out there doing their thing would do what they do best um so you do have a podcast what's your podcast uh well i've got new podcasts coming up so it's not, it's not yet launched. So I had a podcast called Transitional Matters. That's still out there. People can still listen to it. That uh, ran for 20 episodes. That was kind of a monthly one season thing that, that really get, invites experts on from lots of different niches to talk about trends and megatrends, how the world's changing. Okay. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in how the world's changing, Transitional Matters 
is a, is a go-to. Those conversations are still very, very relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, that probably piggybacks the book, Decoding Change. The new podcast, uh, hence my new obsession of playfulness, is just called Being Playful. Uh, that should be out probably September this year, so September 24. Um, and again, that brings in all these different voices. Some of them are researchers in playfulness. Some of them are human resource specialists. Some of them are just people who work in places that that have managed to bring a sense of playfulness to what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I want to bring that that conversation to everybody that that playfulness isn't about being silly or irreverent or childish. It's about what makes us flourish as human beings. And we need to be able to embrace that better and listening to people's stories of how they've done it and how they've potentially even got it wrong at points. Yeah. Um, is, is, is really, really important. Um, and then that, I guess that ties into it. I mean, if people are interested in that playfulness stuff, then, you know, I also am the founder of the, the playfulness Institute, which is a, a not-for-profit, um, and what that's doing is it's it's promoting the latest research in playfulness um, and how it can fit into workplace culture, how we can embrace the, the positive elements of playfulness and build cultures which are dynamic and creative and where, I don't know, people love to work. I mean, is that is it really too big a thing to, to try and dream of that we, right. <laughs> not only we turn up to work and it's okay, but we actually love it. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think that's possible. I, th- I think it's well well within our grasp. We've just gone through 200 years of kind of going the wrong way um, where it's all time. about <laughs> efficiency and key performance indicators. And I don't know, even, even the change of, you know, we, we went through this whole period of hum, human resources and now thankfully we're coming into human capital. We're, we're starting to value humans as humans <laughs> yeah. uh, for a long time. We just saw people as, I don't know, almost commodities. Yeah. And that's, that's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. So, the, the Playfulness Institute tries to provide people with that information. You know, we, we were in workshops, we do seminars, webinars. Uh, if people want to actually test their playfulness uh, score on that on that kind of the three pillar model that I talked about, if they go to the Playfulness Institute, they can do a free quiz and it'll, it'll instantly tell them their scores and each of the three pillars and their overall playfulness score. Um, and then they can build from there. Oh, I'm totally going to do that. I love taking <laughs> quizzes. I think that's so fun. Yeah, that sounds fun. Um, So, okay, you kind of said where people can find you in your book and everything. Do you go on social media? Do you do that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly on LinkedIn. Um, okay. So if people, if people just search for either Chris Marshall or the Playfulness Institute, okay. or a combination of the two, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll pop up. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just been such an interesting conversation. I've absolutely loved it. You're so fascinating with all the different things that you know, and you do, and it's very positive, very optimistic. And I love that. It's so easy just to assume like media, you know, just if you watch all the media and everything, it can really be down. I tell everybody, I don't watch the news, you know, ignorance is bliss. (laughs) That's the way yeah, I feel. And, and, and I think sometimes you don't actually miss out, do you? It's not like you don't know what's going on in the world. Right. In fact, you find space to really find out what's going on in the world because your yeah. head's not just being thrown everywhere by a very clever headline. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was a pleasure and I will definitely be in touch soon. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.